I still assume that you're a Christian brother, okay? I'm a Christian. I assume that you're a Christian brother. But I want to know what is the gospel that you believe in. Because if you have a different gospel, Paul declares you as an anathema. You're out of the church. And I am of the Catholics. And I am of the Orthodox. The apostolic teaching teaches against this kind of division. A prayer to Mary is considered heresy, right? To a Catholic, believing that you're saved by faith alone is heresy. So how are you going to reconcile these massive, massive differences? An atheist! He's saying that we Christians cannot unite. And I say to you, do not listen to the counsel of the devil. Yes. The divisions of the church were a mistake and to simply say that oh it's a fait accompli we can't change the situation is to work from a principle of hopelessness is to work from a principle of task. defeatism like this brother is a hopeless defeatist about this question it's an absolute but what do task. the apostles say they say that the greatest three are these love, sorry, faith, hope, and charity. To live in hope, to live in hope is to live as if the thing that you wish to be is already. And if we desire the unity of the church, if we desire the strength of the church, then we must live as if it is unified and strong already. Which means that we need to rediscover a language of unity. How can we discover that language of unity? We must discover that language of unity by throwing off the language of denominationalism, by throwing off the language of sectarianism and speaking of the body of Christ as a people that has its denominations, the Catholic, the Protestant and the Orthodox. And by rediscovering our identity, not in our denominations, but as the true disciples of Christ, by discovering that as the basis of our identity, as worshippers of the one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, as those who have received baptism, in those things we can discover our unity. And to what end should we discover that unity? We should discover that unity to oppose liberal progressive thought that is working against the kingdom of God. It is to oppose the Salafists and the Islamists who persecute our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is to oppose the communists who wish to create class division and war in our society. It is to oppose the nationalists and the xenophobes who wish to divide the church by race and ethnicity. As Christians, if we find our unity in God, then we can move past these differences that have been made large by the sectarians, by the denominationalists. There is a principle of conscience within the church and maybe this will help you to recognize John Calvin how to go forward. John Calvin in heaven? No, sorry, yes, yes he is, yes, yes, I believe so. There's a principle of conscience in the Christian faith. Listen carefully to what Paul says in Romans. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Meaning that Christians can have different opinions about things and still follow the same faith. One person has faith that he may eat all things but he who is weak eats vegetables only the one who eats 
is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats for God has accepted him who are you to judge the servant of another to his own master he stands or falls and he will stand for the Lord is able to make his stand so the scriptures are teaching that it is not the responsibility of Christians to judge one another. If someone is a disciple of Christ, then leave the judgment to Christ, who is his master. So if he is wrong about this dogma or that dogma, accept him as your brother and let God judge him on his beliefs. Instead, you should work to edify him. So if you disagree, for instance, upon the communion of saints and upon the veneration of saints, it is not for you to pronounce anathema. It is not for you to divide them. It is for you to edify them, to build them up in the Lord and they must act according to their conscience. The brother has a point, but he's not listening to the replies. I am listening. He I isn't an engaging task. with what is being said. It is an impossible task. That's why you had wars. He is a hopeless. Are you a Christian, brother? No. Right. So an atheist, what is your position? What is your belief? An atheist, he's saying that we Christians cannot unite. And I say to you, do not listen to the counsel of the devil. Do not listen to the lies of the devil. Listen to Christ, who said, let them be one, as I am one in you, and you are one in me. Let them be one so that all things might be complete. Let us look at the high priestly prayer of Christ. Because for those of you who believe in scripture, there is no justification for your sectarianism, for your denominationalism, for your factionalism. Listen to what Christ said. The glory which you have given me I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one I in them and you in me that they may be perfect in unity so that the word may so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me father I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world O righteous father although the world has not known you yet I have known you and these have known that you sent me and I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. So Christ is calling for the unity of the church. He is saying that the world will know that the Christ was sent from the Father by the unity that Christians display. And notice that the atheist is using the divisions of the church against us. Notice that the Muslims use the divisions of the church against us. We give the devil strength when we divide ourselves against one another and we fail to be good disciples of our Lord. Go on, brother, you want to make a point? 
I'm saying, I'm saying to you that these, these differences, they're not merely just differences in terms of uh, just pe people have differences. These differences, they're fundamental to the church themselves. I mean, to a Calvinist, uh, a prayer to Mary is considered heresy, right? To a Catholic, believing that you're saved by faith alone is heresy. So how are you going to reconcile these massive, massive differences? They're not merely just, uh, you can't just gloss over them and be happy-go-lucky and just, uh, you know, uh, dance together. Under which church? Under who? Who's going to interpret scripture? You haven't answered any of these questions yet. So, the brother has not listened to anything that has been said. And it's probably because, in his mind, he doesn't have the categories of mind to deal with what is being said. I am saying, and I'll try to explain it to him again for the third time, that the narrative of denominationalism, I am a Calvinist, I am a Lutheran, I am a Catholic, I am Orthodox, that these narratives fail to grasp the truth of Scripture. That those narratives fail to be true disciples of Christ. That the narrative that we should follow is the one laid out in Scripture. That we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people set apart. And we must rediscover a narrative of unity. A way of describing ourselves that does not emphasize the differences, that does not emphasize the disagreement, but meets those disagreements with loving tolerance, that meets those disagreements with the permission of good conscience, that those that we encounter that are following Christ and worshipping one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that have been baptized as his disciples. I've got water, I've got water. Maybe later, bro. That those we should recognize as our brothers and where they are in error, where they are in error, if we believe that they are in error, where we see them acting in weakness, we should give room to their conscience. We must meet them with loving tolerance. And that is the way to build up the unity of the church. It isn't by reaffirming our denominational differences as these two brothers want to. It is about recognizing that that which unites us is much greater than that which divides us and very often that which divides us is based upon an ignorance that the devil is using to turn you against your brethren. Do you have anything more to say? No, I was just going to mention This gentleman here, he says he's a Calvinist, but he considers the Roman Catholic te teaching to be incorrect. Please no. This is, this is the, this is what the I'm brother about. identified as a Calvinist. Denominational narratives. Go on, bro. Well, this is my issue, yeah. Um, this is my issue. You're talking about unity, right? Yeah, 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 you know, my voice is low by nature. <laughs> so this this is the issue. What do you consider, for example, Jehovah Witness as part of the church? No. And if not, why not? Okay. So the question is, are Jehovah's Witnesses... No, I'm going to deal with interact? the question. Can we We're going to deal with the question. So the question was, why are Jehovah's Witnesses not part of the church? They are not part of the church because they do not worship the one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They deny that the Holy Spirit is a divine person and they deny that the Son is one in eosis, one in substance with the Father. They believe that he is a created being, a second God. And this contradicts the apostolic teaching. So I agree with you. I would say that's the reason why they're not Christian. But what is your foundation? What do you utilize 
to say that because of this, they're not Christian. You're saying, okay, they reject the Trinity, therefore they're not Christian. Where'd you get this idea from? Is it from scripture or is it from somewhere else? It is from the Council of Nicaea. When the Council of Nicaea came about in 325, it was to settle the dispute between Arius and Anthony, his bishop. Arius was teaching that Christ was a second god, a demigod. Anthony condemned him for teaching heresy. Arius had a large following in the church and was misguiding many. The Council of Nicaea was formed to clarify what the church was teaching and had always been teaching. And in that council, the bishops came together and stated what was orthodox belief. Arius and two bishops with him were condemned by the church. Now let me ask you, were those, no, let me ask you sectarianist. No, let me ask you, was the council right or wrong? Answer the question. Answer the question. You mentioned the Council of Nicaea. Answer the question. One second. I'll ask you to answer the we question. We haven't finished the topic. We haven't finished answer the, topic. the question. We haven't finished the topic. Was the Council of Nicaea right or wrong? Don't run away. Was it right or wrong? Do you want to address the topic or you want I am, to... I am addressing the topic. You've engaged me with I the question. I haven't finished my question. You have answered a question. You haven't question. answered my question. I have answered your question. No, you have We'll do a question for a question. Let me finish. Okay, he doesn't want to have a dialogue. So Tell I'll continue. What the of says. So I will continue. What does the Council of Trent so, answer his question. So these sectarianists who are in agreement with the devil, what does the Council of who are in agreement with the devil, ignore the scripture that they claim to believe in. Because what does the scripture say? When he wants to answer my question, I will answer one of his. Tell me Until that time, he's not here to dictate the conversation. If he wants to give his own talk, he can do it elsewhere. If he wants to engage in a dialogue, he can answer questions as well as ask them. Are you willing to answer the question? So the question I want you to answer, you agree that Arians were not Christians. Was the Council of Nicaea right for making that judgment. The reason why Arians are not Christians is not because of the Council of Nicaea, it's because of what Scripture says about who Jesus is. The count, the, the, he so says the Scripture. You follow counsel. This is not the canon of Scripture was not settled and four te until 410. Here's Jesus. what actually the Council of Nicaea did. I've answered your question, can I ask the question? You didn't answer the question. Forget about Council of Nicaea. Because I asked you if they were right in their judgment, How many you, you equivocated on the question. So, the Council of Nicaea came together and they made three kinds of argument. Three strands of argument. Strand one. They quoted the scriptures. Strand two, they talked about what was taught in their churches, i.e. their catechism, their baptism, their oral tradition. And they also made philosophical arguments of the like that goes like this. If the Father was eternal, because God is unchanging, then whom was he eternally the father to? Obviously, he has to be eternally the father to someone, and the answer is, he is eternally the father to the son. Which means that the son did not come into existence. Now, let me ask you, brother, do you reject 
those strands of argument. What is the gospel, Bob? Answer my... No, go on. I said we'll do a question for a question. No, I've answered your question. And you you ignored it and you dodged it, but go on. Okay, answer I'll, let, I'll let the audience decide that. I know for sure, and you know, that I've answered your question. I have a question for you. As a Christian, okay, I, I still assume that you're a Christian brother, okay? I'm a Christian. I assume that you're a Christian brother. But I want to know what is the gospel that you believe in. Because if you have a different gospel, Paul declares you as anathema. You're out of the church. In scripture, not in a council, it's in scripture. So I want to know what is the gospel. We as Christians, we are to preach the gospel to Muslim, atheist, whatever. What is the gospel that you're preaching? Is it by faith alone? I what, is it? what is it? What is it? I want to know Almighty, that. Maker of That's not enough. Enough. That's That's enough. Invisible and invisible. That's not and in one Lord Jesus Christ, Once the only begotten yeah. Son of God, That's begotten enough. of the Father Let before all ages. Light from light, true God from God. He's through talking God. about his scripture, his scripture book. Not made, unsubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. How are we saved for our salvation? How are we saved down from heaven? How are we saved for our salvation? 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 The Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. He rose again on the third day, in accordance with the Scriptures. And he ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand of the Father. He's coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets, and in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one, one baptism, baptism for, for the forgiveness of sins and I await the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That is what we believe in. I mean, now that is what it. Christians now have it. always now believed. Now do you deny it? Deny it. Deny it. Do you deny it? Do you deny it? Do you deny it? Do you deny it? He doesn't want to... Notice the sectarian doesn't want to answer the question. Let's do this. I'll say what the gospel is. Do you? No. Brother. You said what do we believe in? Akuma, we're not here to give him a platform. If he's not willing to engage, I will continue with the presentation. You say you're not giving me a platform. So, you know I'm a Christian like you. So, you're not. Brother, you're the, he is, he's just a sectarian. I want to know what the gospel is. The devil is in your ear, brother. The devil is in your ear. You're letting the devil speak to you. That is what you're doing. George, what, what do this is what the apostles did. I want to know and what the gospel this is, is what he rejects. What's the gospel? This is what he rejects. Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sothenes our brother. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions amongst you but that you be made complete in the same mind, in the same judgment. For have I have informed you concerning my brethren, my Chloe's people, that there are quarrels amongst you. Now I mean this, that each of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Now listen, let's put this in modern language. Let us put modern language into this. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels amongst you. Now I mean this, that each of you is saying, I am of the Lutherans, and I am of the Calvinists, and I am of the Catholics, and I am of the Orthodox. The apostolic teaching teaches against this kind of division. And the sectarianists, whilst they are Christian, have believed a lie of the devil. They have believed a lie of the devil and they have failed to be good disciples of Christ. Has Christ been divided, Paul continues. Paul was not crucified for you. That's the gospel all Christians believe in. That's the gospel all Christians unite upon. Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again. We are united because we are all baptized 
in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Paul is addressing the divisions of the church and he is saying what are the points of your unity? Does he say whether you are unified on the communion of saints? Does he say that you are unified on believing in 62 books of the Bible or 72? Does he say that you are unified on the idea that grace operates through faith alone or that grace operates through faith and works? No, he says that your unity is in Christ crucified and the name in which you were baptized. So, there you have it, brothers and sisters. The apostolic challenge to each of us is to rise up and discover the unity of the church and declare Christ crucified to bring to baptism those in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit to make disciples of all men and to bring them to the love of God. Do not have any part with the sectarian narrative. Break your mind free of it because Christ in his apostles said be renewed by the transforming of your mind. Discover a new narrative of unity. And with that, I leave you in peace because I'm getting tired. God bless. Can I just speak to you? Yeah, Zach, exactly you okay? You're doing yeah. right. So the argument is, in Surah 29, 27, it says, We bestowed upon him and Isaac's son Jacob and caused prophethood and revelation to continue among his offspring. Meaning that prophethood was given to the nation of Israel through Isaac, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. No mention of Israel. Prophethood is in the line of Israel. And we've got different translations, Pictol, Shakir and Faridul Haq all translate it the same way. So in other words, the Quran is saying that prophethood is peculiar to a people, which is in agreement with what the Old Testament also teaches. <coughs> and it says in Genesis, for example, 1721, however, my covenant I shall establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you as appointed, uh, as appointed time next year. And in Surah 4516, it says, and verily we gave the children of Israel the scripture and the command and the prophethood. So prophethood was given to Israel. Therefore, if the Quran is internally coherent, how can Muhammad be a prophet? Go get him, bro. Right, who's going to go film this guy and who's going to stay with me? Make a choice. Let me just show you what the scriptures say about hope. Hey, what happened to the live stream, Bob? Uh, it, it got stopped for a minute. So we're just talking with this brother. It, it was uh, continuing from. Um, it was continuing from the question about um, the denominationalism and the sectarianism. The brother was saying that it's an insurmountable problem and that it can't be overcome. And I was saying to him that that's not a Christian way to deal with a problem. The Christian way to deal with any problem is to work from the basis of hope, is to work from a position of hope. Because hope is to, to work as if the things that you are hoping for have come to pass, yeah? Um, so let me just, uh, let me just find it for you. So the, the, the point that I'm making is is that as Christians, we have to walk as if the, the thing that we look for is already. So if we want the church to be unified and strong, we have to walk and talk and act as if the church is unified and strong so that it makes it more likely that the thing that we're hoping for will be. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. And it doesn't mean necessarily that the thing that you hope for will come to pass. There's no guarantee. But if you walk in hope that the thing that you hope for can come to pass, it's more likely to happen than not. Imagine if you wake up one day and say to yourself, there's 
no point me applying for jobs because I'll never get one. Yeah? Yeah? If you start your day by dismissing the possibility, yeah, that something can come about, you won't walk in it. Right? But what does it say as, as Christians? We're to walk by faith and in hope. So I'll just show you what that looks like. So in Hebrews 11, it says this, yeah, and this, guys, is something that all of you can apply to anything in your life. What, what is the problem that you face? Are you jobless? Are you single? Are you homeless? Yeah? What's the problem that you face? Are you lacking motivation or direction? What's the problem that you face? The scriptures say, walk in hope, walk in faith. So let's just go and see what that looks like. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. So as Christians, the things that we hope for are the things that we should strive towards. And by striving towards them, we will make it more likely that it will happen. It will prove our character. It will develop us as people. We live in a world where constantly we're counseled to give up. That isn't the Christian way. The Christian way is to walk by faith in the things hoped for. That's what we are to do. Yeah? So if I hope for church unity, then I walk by faith that your church unity will exist. And that means that I work towards church unity. And what does this kind of faith, walking in hope, achieve? I'll give you examples. All these died in faith without receiving the promises but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. So these people were walking in a way of faith, in hope of another land, of another place. And what did they achieve by it? I'll tell you what they achieved. And for time, and what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword, from weakness they were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. These are the kinds of things that can be achieved if you walk in faith, in the hope that you have. You're a desperate man, bro. In short, you need more hope in your life. Appreciate that things it, are Appreciate achievable. It. That things can be made to happen. Somewhere along your journey in life, you gave up hope on certain questions. I'm inviting you to revisit those questions and ask again. And ask again if the things that you once hoped for can become realities. Have hope and walk in faith that the thing that you walk in faith for shall come about. But then the question is, to what end? Because as a Christian, our end is the kingdom of God and the glory of God. It isn't our own personal enrichment, our own personal benefit, our own personal glory. We're supposed to be debased in all of these things, humble, seeking God's glory. So what do we walk in? What is our hope? Our hope is that we will glorify God and expand our God's kingdom. That we will add to his bride, the church. That we will disciple people in the way of the Lord, that they might live heroic and virtuous lives. That's the faith that I'm calling you to. That's the hope that I am calling you to. So that on the day of resurrection, you will rise with the saints. Appreciate the message. Think about it. All right. Thank Have hope. Thank you for the good. Yo, no worries. Take care. So, just continuing that that message, let's look at some of the the ways that hope is spoken about in the Christian faith. 
You what, sorry? Okay. So let us look. So I'll give you an example of hope. So this is this is what Paul spoke. His hope was to stay with the Corinthian church. Now please note, he didn't say, I'm going to. He said, if the Lord permits. But the thing is, he had a desire and he was going to walk in that desire. So what is your hope? What are you working towards? Do you hope for a family? Are you working in that way? Do you hope for the triumph of the church? Are you walking in that way? Do you hope for a job? Are you walking in that way? What is your hope? Because if you have hope, then you need to make plans and walk in that direction. Let's just take a step back to allow people to walk past us. So if you want to continue listening. So, let's use another example of Paul and hope. Paul wrote a letter to two Corinthians. And this is what he said. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. And I hope you will understand until the end. In other words, your hope has to be met with pragmatic action. If you hope for something, what are you doing about it? If you hope that something will come about, what are you doing to make it a reality? Hope is a practical thing. It is something that you work for. For we, as it says in scripture, for we through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. So, hope is about an expectation of what is to come. It is about walking into that expectation. And as Christians, if we have hope that the church will be triumphant, we must work to that end. If we have hope that the church will be unified, then we must work to that end. If we have hope that we can defeat the Salafists, the Communists, the Nationalists and the Xenophobes, then we must work to that end. Because our hope is in the righteousness to come that Christ has promised us. Just another example of hope. Remember that you were at, the at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God. You see, in the world, you see, as Christians, we have been transferred into a promised land. We have been transferred into a new covenant. We have hope. We have hope that these covenants are bringing about our salvation. That before, when we were in the world, we had no hope in enjoying or celebrating. This is the hope that I call you to. The Christian way of life is a Christian way of life built upon faith, hope and love. We've talked a lot about love, but now it's time to understand hope. Because hope will mean that you will get out of bed every morning. If you lack hope, then your heart and your soul begins to die. People who are suffering from depression, from mental illness, lack hope. People who are disillusioned about their life, lack hope. But as Christians, we are called to be a people of hope. This isn't as some wishy-washy kind of hippie way where we see hope as some sentimental feeling. Hope is meant to be the very virtue that inspires us to action, that inspires us to get out of bed and do the thing that we need to do. That is the kind of community that we are called to be. And what is our hope? Our hope is in Jesus Christ and the new covenant. Our hope is in the resurrection, in the new world to come, and that the kingdom of God that we are a part of play, is playing a part in bringing those things about. So we have an agenda. We have a manifesto. 
And now it's time to get busy making that manifesto a reality. That is the hope that I call you to. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.